Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sophia Mapranga. I'm a freelance journalist who's based in Zimbabwe, and I work for an online publication called ZimEye. ZimEye is based in London, but we basically work from Harare. We, um, I also am a coordinator uh, for the Zimbabwean team in Harare, but we work with other freelance journalists who are also based all over Zimbabwe. My topic here is I'm going to be talking about online safety in Zimbabwe post Mugabe, uh, that is with the current administration led by Emerson Lambutsamunangabo. So my presentation structure is such that I'm going to give a, ba a brief background on my country, Zimbabwe, and I'll also talk about the political context where we're coming from, and I will speak to the media landscape, what laws and regulation and the legislation that guides the media environment in Zimbabwe, and I will also speak about how journalism is threatened in Zimbabwe and especially focusing on us as digital security, um, as digital uh, media journalists. And um, I will then speak to the issues of how we are addressing the threats and the challenges in what I have termed as circumventing the threats. Zimbabwe is a country that is found in Southern Africa and it is a landlocked country. We share our borders with uh, Zambia, Mozambique, Malawi and uh, Botswana. And we have a population of 17.3 million inhabitants, that is according to the latest uh, population uh, census. And we have 16 official languages. Well, don't ask me how many I know from there. But we have Chewa, Chibare, English, Kalanga, Shangan, Sign Language, which belongs to Zimbabwe. We have Isitosa, Chivenda, Tswana, Tonga, you name it, 16. Zimbabwe is one of the Southern African countries that abandoned uh, its own local currency in 2008 when we reached a record-breaking 231% um, million percent inflation and we have been using multi-currency but thank God um, in November just last month we have a new currency that was introduced where we have adopted our very own Zimbabwean dollar. Our literacy rate is viewed as one of the best in Africa at 86.5%, um, which means we are very highly literate population. And our economy is agro-based and driven by manufacturing, mining, and uh, agriculture. And however, we are ranked um, 156 out of 187 on uh, the Global Hunger Index, which means we are currently a very low income uh, and food deficit country. But the good news is the majestic Victoria Falls is better viewed in Zimbabwe. So I'm going to invite all of you to come to Zimbabwe. The political landscape in the country is um, such that, you know, we wouldn't have done justice if we do not talk about the late, great Robert Gabriel Mugabe. He was considered one of Africa's oldest and longest serving leader of a nation. Ever since we attained independence, he was at the helm of power for 36 years. But Mugabe was deposed um, in one of uh, Africa's soft coups by his closest uh, and most best friend, Emerson Lambutomunangagwa. Um, but the late great died on September 6, 2019. May his soul rest in peace. 
Emma Sonda Mutsumunanga is the current Zimbabwean president who came to power in uh, November on the 17th through the soft coup that I have talked about. And he was then elected in the elections that came in July 2018. Of course, the elections were disputed with claims of rigging and all sorts of election mal malpractices, but he was declared winner by the Constitutional Court um, in 2018 and inaugurated the official president of Zimbabwe, but currently he's presiding over a failing economy. Press freedom in Zimbabwe is such that under Mugabe, when we want to talk about Mugabe, the journalists and the media, they were attacked publicly, they were censored, journalists were arrested in broad daylight, taken to court, their um, cases pending, and um, economic harassment was prevalent to an extent that journalism in Zimbabwe is also considered um, compromised due to checkbook journalism and we have legally, the environment is conducive for legal harassment of journalists and even the media houses. According to the World uh, Press Freedom uh, Index status, Zimbabwe is number 123 out of 180, that is um, according to statistics found in, um, released in 2019. And in the picture that you are seeing there, a journalist was being physically harassed by the police, beaten up by the butter sticks, by the button sticks and his camera confiscated and we have uh, you know the state through the police telling him to delete footage um, in broad daylight fortunately for him someone captured the image from afar and that is how um, that image got into the public domain The legal environment in Zimbabwe is such that we have our constitution, which was enacted in 2013, speaking to the issues that guarantee media freedom and freedom of expression, freedom of speech. But the challenge in Zimbabwe is such that we have other laws that were crafted under Mugabe that are still in existence that uh, stifle the freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Unfortunately, the situation is also such that um, those laws are still existing and they have not yet been aligned to the Constitution. Hence, there is still that gap that while the, Constitution while the Constitution guarantees media freedom, the existing laws that are on the ground, they are still used to attack, censor, and um, stifle freedom of expression. We have also in the Constitution a certain provision that speaks to the issue of uh, statutory regulation uh, that sets up a body called the Zimbabwe Media Commission, which um, forces every media house to register, which forces even journalists to register their practice. You find that um, under this section, the constitution, uh, the the ZNC is constituted in a way that um, you know government affiliated or state affiliated individuals sit on that on that board. Hence, you find that the media is very much regulated with partisan uh, agendas, where it's not really very easy for someone in the independent or a business person or a private player to enter the media market. Hence, our media is very, very polarized, where we have very few TV stations, radio stations that are given the licenses to operate in Zimbabwe. They are one way or the other affiliated to the government and they only churn out propaganda that is pro-government. We have legislation called IPA, Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act, 
which regulates uh, three aspects, that is the access to information, media freedom, and the protection of privacy and personal information. We also have legislation called the Official Secrets Act, which bars journalists and officials from releasing what is deemed as um, confidential or information that might cause public discord. So all this makes um, the environment unconducive for journalists to work. And we have the maintenance uh, of peace and order MOPA, which currently replaced POSA, that was the Public Order and Security Act. And basically what uh, this law says is that any churning out any information or publishing any, any information that may cause public disorder is deemed an offence and you can be taken to court and charged. And we also have the Criminal Law Codification and Reform Act, which bars journalists from publishing information that is viewed as contrary to state security or that harms big people, politicians, the president. The law, the Criminal Law Codification and Reform Act has been used in most instances in the past by the state to stifle uh, the publishing of information. I recall our very own uh, former first lady donated used um, underwear and the journalist wrote the story that the first lady donated used underwear and he was taken to court. And we also have the 2007 Interception of Communications Act, which is also used by the government to intercept any communication which when they suspect that you are communicating against the national interest, they can intercept your communication with whoever using that act. When we talk of, of the progress in Zimbabwe, we look at that picture, basically maybe you are seeing just a picture of a president. That is the president who is wearing the scarf and um, the surroundings there at the state house and he's surrounded by journalists from foreign correspondents and the private media. For, for me when I look at that picture I see progress. Why? Because under Mugabe we never used to have this kind of scenario where a journalist can be close to the president. The president was basically a preserve of the state media and the content would be regulated, what he says and how he says it, it's regulated. You want, the private media would get the information from the state media. But for me, uh, when I look at that picture, I see a bit of uh, warmth, uh, you know, a, a bit of progress to say, at least he's warming up to the private media, he's warming up to foreign journalists, and currently when you, you're a foreign journalist, it is still a bit difficult to come to Zimbabwe, but it's much better than it was before. You'll be deported straight at the airport, but now at least you'll be allowed to come into the country and report on the issues, and it's a really, uh, for me, it's progress. So what are the threats that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. I have said in the beginning that I work for an online publication that is based in the UK, and sometimes when we do our stories and we cover our stories, we have to send them to the UK or we communicate and uh, also publish them uh, on our UK-based um, publication. We face the threat of uh, surveillance from the state, from the business, from the politicians, from even the church. We also face physical harm where our gadgets can be confiscated. In Zimbabwe, the situation is such that the police, they do not um, investigate to arrest, but they arrest to investigate. And the minute they arrest you, they can use the law to get your gadget get all the information that they want or even delete some of it if they want. So 
all those are threats that we face on a daily basis. We also face the threat of imprisonment, based on all the laws that I spoke to earlier on. And we have censorship, which is on one end, um, because of the threats that we face, you can self-censor yourself, or you can censor yourself basing on the legal environment that you operate in. And we also are sometimes blackmailed by politicians, you're blackmailed by even the business people, because these are people that are very, very powerful. And we also face the risk of abuse of power, where even the politicians, they can abuse their power to churn out hate speech, certain statements that personally harm you. And we also have the risk of denial of justice where the processes, the justice delivery process becomes cumbersome to an extent that the journalists can spend the better part of their time attending court sessions, you know, seeking legal counsel and uh, we also face the risk of hacking uh, for the publications that we work with. So we show, I am showing you a picture of a journalist at work that was um, in uh, some time two months ago when journalists were covering protests in central Harare and that woman was beaten up. But then just a few seconds after you know someone captured that picture all those journalists were some of them were beaten up and one even broke his arm because the police they just came they didn't want the journalist to capture that image and they had to disperse the journalists using their button sticks so what are the potential impacts of the threats on the journalist we face physical fear, you know, when you fear for your life, you fear what is going to happen to me, you fear for the personal harm, you fear for your family to say, are my children safe, am I even safe? And professionally, we tend to self, to then self-censor ourselves, we tend to incur the costs when you lose the equipment that you normally have and because in Zimbabwe the economic situation is very very harsh you find that most instances when a journalist loses their gadget or their gadget is destroyed there is no one to insure it and you have to pay it for it again using your own money and on the sources, it then breaks the kind of rapport that you need for you to get the classified information, which you can't get officially because of the various legislation that I spoke to, the Official Secrets Act, which makes it a criminal offense to get information that can cause public dis discord. And there is also mistrust when um, that information leaks and it is taken by the state or the business or whoever will use it to show that they know and they have intercepted your communication. And on news production, this is a scenario where you realize that the polarization is very much um, amplified because, you know, the information that the states want to be in the public domain is the only information that gets there. There is no balance and the news production becomes shoddy and um, not so good. In Zimbabwe, when you look at that picture, we have the police basically, or should I say, representing the state. They are the biggest perpetrators of physical harm on journalists because they can beat you and they can confiscate your gadgets or they can take you to for detention and legally harass you before even justice is um, attained. So how are we as um, Zim I circumventing some of these threats? As an online publication, um, we after the training workshop that I attended here at RSF, 
one of the key take-homes that I took from the training workshop was that I was supposed to think like an attacker. Initially, when I would communicate with my sources, I didn't quite put it in my mind to think that our communication can be intercepted. Fine, most journalists, after graduating from the journalism school, we know how to do our work. But in terms of digital security, I wasn't that informed to know that my information was that compromised. So basically what we do is, after this training, as one of the coordinators for my Zimbabwean team, I've kind of like held trainings, and these trainings are not as sophisticated as we had here, but we generally talk about how to protect ourselves, we talk about how to create model, that is how to identify our adversaries, how do we protect our gadgets, what is the best strategy that we can use to do that, and we brainstorm as a team to say this is the obtaining situation and this is what is happening and we identify who is our potential threat and we identify why would they want to attack us or maybe get this information from us. So we really have managed to conduct these mini trainings which are like talks that we have as a team in-house to speak about all those issues and find out the best strategies on how to protect ourselves online. And one of the key issues that we have done is we have all capacitated each other to understand the importance of secure internet surfing and on the, inter on the importance of why we should use, H we should use HTTPS. Uh, when we, whenever we're connecting online. We have also done, uh, you know, talks on how, on the importance of editing and uh, auditing and deleting some of the sensitive information that we receive. When we do this, we kind of like establish the system on how best to do this and we also identified its importance to say why is it very important that the information that we get potentially when your gadget is hacked or your gadget is confiscated what is it that um, you know what are what are the possible implications for it and how best can we do it so as a team we have made it a point of course it can never be a hundred percent perfect, but the knowledge and um, the importance of knowing why we should do that is, you know, everybody now knows about it. And also basing on um, everything that we have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have also identified uh, on the importance on how to stay alert to phishing attempts and what are the best uh, strategies that we can do? How do you, you know, work against that? How, how do you prevent uh, the phishing attempts? And we have also identified um, the importance of using tool um, to protect one's anonymity online. And we also, as a team, now know the importance of two-step verification is um, a strategy of uh, countering the digital threats that we face. Encrypted communication um, is also one of the things that we have identified, why we should use uh, Signal, ProtoMail, WhatsApp, and what information can we relay using all those platforms, when and how. And um, we have also, you know, as a team, also identified the importance of uh, encrypting our computer gadgets and um, how we can be storing important data on external storage devices in the event that one maybe loses their gadget. And we also have, as a team, also invested in the latest antivirus and antispiral software. And we also uh, have encouraged each other on device security, secure and unique passwords, why is it important to create a secure password, which one is a secure password, how do you create it, 
and uh, password protection both online and offline, um, how do we use the password manager, all those are some of the things that we do talk about in our trainings and we as a team keep on um, reminding and encouraging each other to ensure that we always like up to date. We have also as a team um, come up with uh, strategies on how to keep our computers safe from, you know, uh, the state, from the hackers, even from the thieves who sometimes end up trading our, you know, our information that they find, find on our gadgets. And uh, we have also, you know, leveraged ourselves on the VPN use and um, why it's important to you know protect your computer the screen of your computer and why it's also very important to install a privacy badge whenever you're online so on the physical harm in zimbabwe like for the gadgets and on the person it really is a 50 50 situation because you know when you go to cover protests like for our publication we sometimes do live stream on our facebook page you really have to watch out for the button stick otherwise if you stay focused on the protest and not look out for um, the button stick from the police officer then you're in for a surprise we have a scenario there where journalists marched to the police headquarters because of the increased um, physical harm on journalists and their gadgets. But obviously, just like the organizations uh, that work with the media in Zimbabwe say that journalism is under fire in Zimbabwe and the situation is not really changed with the coming in of the new president who happens to preach um, that he's operating using a new dispensation. So cases of uh, police assault on journalists in Harare is kind of like a daily occurrence and journalists are harassed, they're beaten up, their gadgets confiscated and sometimes they're even detained, taken together with protesters, even when they are putting on their media jackets, your camera is confiscated and then you're taken to in police custody, but you then rescued made most probably by the lawyers. So what has the training workshop um, from RSF contributed to my work? Basically when I came here, I was one of the journalists who was not so, uh, we didn't quite understand the importance of digital security, but because I then gained new insights on how threatened my work was, I gained a lot of knowledge on uh, how to identify my own, my own personal threats and the organizational threats. And I also gained a lot of knowledge on the available tools for use. But above all, I think one of the key takeaways was the capacity to also, you know, go back to my country and also train other journalists on online safety, which is something that I, you know, I'm very much enjoying doing and it has been embraced a lot, especially in the media organization that I work with. For, and the journalists are very like forthcoming. We ask questions, you know, we try and find answers together and we find out how best to do things in order to protect ourselves digitally. So in conclusion, I would say journalism is more than just writing the story. Um, like what we were taught in journalism school because the harassment, the intimidation, the threats, they are all, um, and the surveillance, they are all, you know, realities that are there on the ground, especially when you are a professional journalist. And if you are deemed, say, by the government to be a dissenting voice, 
you find that there is more surveillance on your person, there is even threats on, of physical harm on yourself, you receive emails, you receive trolls, you know, and sometimes you're even threatened publicly by the very influential and um, political leadership of the country. And the good news about all this is that uh, for every difficult part of a job, there's always a way that you can circumvent and ensure that uh, at least you make the challenges that you're facing easier to deal with. And I would like to say the RSF Digital Security Training Workshop capacitated me to do just that. I thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, super interesting. I take the thank you for the whole team. <laughs> uh, they, um, yeah, also thank you for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I take uh, the opportunity to ask the first question uh, because you mentioned one word um, without really explaining it, and it's a word I, I learned from you, uh, which is checkbook journalism. Um, and for you it's obviously obviously quite normal, me being a journalist uh, who was educated uh, in, in Germany, uh, this was like, okay, what is now checkbook journalism? I also want to be paid for journalism, but could you explain what is that and why is that a problem? So for, thank you Daniel for your question. Checkbook journalism, we tend to call it checkbook journalism in Zimbabwe. This is journalism where journalists are kind of like given the brown envelope. Um, when I talk about the brown envelope, maybe you'll understand better. Uh, you have, when I get, like, I'll give you an example to say I get a story about a business person and that business person, they offer me money not to publish that story and we consider that checkbook journalism in Zimbabwe where you get a certain amount of money to stifle and, and ensure that you publish, you don't publish that story. So it really has become a very like big problem in Zimbabwe to say when someone they don't want their story to be published they simply give you some money, um, we call it brown envelope or checkbook journalism. And why I was asking that um, is because you mentioned that now the new president tries to at least be nice to private media as well, um, at least speaks to them, meets them. Um, do you think that this could also be a downside, that they also try to, from the state perspective, try to um, yeah, uh, enforce this kind of checkbook journalism also more to the privately owned media? or? Is it already happening or what, what do you think of that? Well, I'll give my own personal perspective basing on what I have you know, experienced ever since the new president came into power. You would realize that there's been kind of like an upsurge in terms of like other media and other online publications that have come on board. And although not confirmed officially, there is kind of like speculation that, you know, the president is actually funding, you know, the, some of the private media organizations to, you know, view him in a particular certain light. Um, I'll give you an example to say we have some publications that were really like critical of the government that would tell it as it is. They've kind of like softened. On, in terms of critiquing government, which is something that even the people, uh, the general populace, then they are noticing that you know something has changed, and you have you will also have a scenario where you would say some of the in independent media, like the top bosses of some of the independent media, they now are part of the administration to say they are now sitting on in certain positions within the new government, say someone who owns the one of the biggest um, media organization, independent media organization is now called a presidential advisor. Of course they have declared to say you know, my, my media house has got nothing to do with my personal work, but obviously there is always that, you know, compromise to say who do you represent. You are advising the person that you're critiquing, how does that work? 
So you realize that you know we're kind of like in a catch fifty situation, and you have a scenario where the president is also investing a lot in the media. Why? Because there is a certain narrative that they want to change globally to say this is a new dispensation. We are now reforming. We want to re-engage with um, you know the world, and we are no longer in that Mugabe era. So you find that there is a certain stance that they are also like taking to make sure that they open up the spaces. Of course, um, in a way, one would argue to say, is this a genuine issue? Is it really like genuine? Because it's, it's, it's really a catch-50 situation. Thank you. Um, all right, now I would open it for you. And there's already the first question from our colleague from Oman, if I remember correctly. Um, a journalist, um, female journalist, Hajir Abraissouni uh, from Morocco, went to prison for um, uh, abortion. Yeah, for abortion. So uh, def defamation for women is a strong tool uh, to stop women from uh, working working or practice the work. Could you give us an example uh, in, in, in your country if you have similar uh, for women journalists? Thank you. For women journalists in Zimbabwe, obviously, you know, it's very difficult to work in the media. When you want to look at, like, the statistics of how many women actually graduate as journalists in media school, you find that the number outweigh the men. But because of the heat in the industry, most women, they tend to leave the profession and they tend to go to other pro professions like the PR jobs, the marketing, or they divert. And also when you look at the hierarchy within the media houses, it's not conducive for women. Very few women make it. and. A, a report, um, sorry, a study was conducted, I think it was about three or so years ago, to say there's really like a glass ceiling where female journalists don't really make it in the media industry. They are not accorded to the space and um, they're not even, you know, acknowledged. Even when you're very good at doing your job, if you rise through the ranks, you know, society and even colleagues, they tend to label you to say you have used your gender or, you know, you, you, you're dating the, the editors or, you know, you're seeing someone who's big for you to rise through the decks. You are not really recognized basing on your ability or your capacity of what you can deliver. So it's really very difficult to work as a female journalist. It's difficult to work as a journalist in general, but it becomes more difficult when you are female because you can't even get the space, you can't even get the recognition. And when you do get the recognition, society, even fellow journalists, they vilify you, they, you know, they say all sorts of things to motivate you to say that even when you're a married woman like myself, you will end up, you know, ditching the profession to say, what will my husband say if he hears that, you know, I'm dating someone who's big for me to rise through the ranks. Nobody really recognizes you for what you can do. So it really is very difficult. Okay, actually I got another question here which I'm going to read out, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, why uh, the state forces attack journalists covering protests when the new state head is actually warming up towards press? Well, that is a question that all of us have been trying to demystify even as, as the media. We have a scenario where we're coming from a political be uh, background where there's a lot of factionalism within the ranks of the ruling party. So the, the issue is, this is why I said it's a catch-50 situation, you don't know who's way and, you know, he's, is he really genuine on reforms or not? Or is it someone who's trying to sabotage him? Because you find that the police and the state, they, you know, they publicly harass journalists in broad daylight. And yet you have the president, you know, warming up to the press and, um, you know, making it look like the environment is conducive for journalists to be working now. So it, we, we really can't 
quite answer that question because we don't know whether it's their internal factional fights or it's he's not genuine on his reform agenda and he just wants to present himself to the world and say he's reforming and yet on the ground he's not. So all right. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I mentioned at the beginning that you have about 16 languages in Zimbabwe. So how is this a problem for journalism? I don't think that you have um, 16 different newspapers written in different languages. But how is this a problem for you? So Zimbabwe, we mostly are an English-speaking nation. So all these languages, they come in basically as, um, you know, complementing English. So for me, um, even when, if, if you recall, when I made my presentation, I said it really is also very difficult for anyone to register, even a community radio station, which is, you know, which speaks to one of those uh, languages. So we have a scenario where most of our work as journalists, it's in English, and the radio stations that are available, they mostly try and incorporate the other languages that um, I spoke to. Of course, they are still struggling on incorporating all of them because it really is a polarized media where the state controls um, and has um, most of the radio stations and TV stations, but basically you find that in Zimbabwe, the most common languages that we speak is English, maybe Shona and Ndebele, and these languages were enacted, um, you know, were officially recognized in 2013 when we had our new constitution, because it's, it's something that uh, the community is pushed for to say, can you also recognize our languages? for national events and uh, stuff, so you find that, but basically the language that we speak is English. Okay. The news item from your country I saw in the last days was about asking for food aid from the international community on the one hand, and buying Chinese technology to control the population. A rather strange combination. Can you say something about the, what they are up to with the Chinese technology? So the Chinese technology was bought uh, to it was basically cameras that they wanted to put on the streets of Harare to monitor traffic and you, we, in Zimbabwe, our greatest challenge is that we, while on the other hand, we are a food deficit country and, you know, we're having all those challenges, we have an administration that focuses on totally different things and, you know, the opposition actually is on record saying, you know, the current administration is you know, misplaced priorities, which is something that you witnessed. And um, yes, indeed, we are currently like facing a lot of challenges in terms of food, uh, even the urban population. They need food, but the government, they don't have capacity to feed the nation. And we also face a looming drought. And, you know, our economy is really, you know, in a, in a very difficult position. So, yes, we have a government that is there. They say one thing on the other end, and the issues that are happening on the ground, you know, are contrary to exactly what they'll be doing because we need food aid, but then they're investing a lot of money on, you know, technology to monitor traffic in the streets of Harare, which is misplaced priorities, I would say. If I, and if I may add, um, I could say from the RSF perspective that uh, Zimbabwe in that question is unfortunately uh, not a single case for Africa. There are a lot of countries uh, who more and more rely on China slash Chinese technology uh, for multiple reasons. I think the two most important ones is first, um, there's a core difference between technology coming from Europe or the US, mostly like Apple or whatever, 
um, and Chinese. Um, the Chinese uh, manufacturers are mostly, at least partially, state-owned uh, and do not believe that the Chinese government would allow to have the best uh, security available on the market implemented uh, there because they need vectors, they need uh, the interfaces to intercept. And of course this is um, much more interesting for repressive governments uh, than uh, the latest iPhone did is uh, maybe not perfect in terms of security, but the best we could have, uh, which makes it uh, mostly impossible for states to just easily um, hack devices. And the second thing is um, that um, in a lot of cases the governments don't have to pay now, but they can pay later or they can pay with uh, yeah, resources from the nature, which is something China really, China really needs. Uh, if you're more interested in that, I can just uh, hint you to a report that RSF published, I think it was at the beginning of the year, about China doing exactly that. It's in English available. Um, don't know the name yet, but something with China. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, Sada? Yeah. Thank you, Sophia, for the presentation. My question is, um, what's the reaction of, of the citizens in Zimbabwe to this harassment of journalists by police? Is there any kind of solidarity? I can remember two years ago, in November 2017, during the anti-Mugabe protest, the whole country rallied um, on one point. So during that rally, do they also protect journalists when there's harassment by, by police? Yes, there is a lot of solidarity in terms of um, whenever journalists are harassed, you have, we have, in Zimbabwe we have a very like vibrant civil society, of course it's now being diluted because, you know, the current administration has realized the importance of civil society, so we have, you know, new civil society organizations that are coming on board, but we basically have a lot of solidarity in terms of the citizens, in terms of like the civil society and you know other players, interested players that have also come on board and speak to these issues. So yes, journalism, um, you know, the citizens they really appreciate the importance of a free press and whenever a journalist is harassed, you know, they really come in their numbers. And in some instances, it has even resulted in some of the cases being, you know, um, treated with urgency. And we have journalists who have, you know, been uh, released from police custody because of, you know, the solidarity from civilians. 